is awake, has a way to sleeping giant. Come on, now we can do it. We need to revive, re up, and re up the labor movement. Anything in life. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Check out the website, thericksmithshow.com. Questions, comments, something on your mind. You can email me, Rick, at thericksmithshow.com. I, you know, taking a look at what's going on, I look at these job numbers, and, you know, it's it's kind of one of those things that, you know, you go, the job number's not bad, things working out. Uh, things could be better. And as I've said, you know, the wages have have ticked down a bit. And you would think with this great job growth, with the number of jobs that are are, are being created, two and a half million additional jobs uh, last year alone, you would think you would think that wages would be going up because, you know, supply and demand, all of that stuff. A five percent unemployment, which used to be viewed as full employment. You would think wages would be going up. Families would be doing better. Uh, that hasn't been the case. And as I've said, I think that it comes back to collective bargaining. It comes back to policy, which is why who we put into office is so very important, which is why we've asked our good friend Admiral Joe Sestak to come back on the program, talk about his plan to restore the American dream for working folks. Joe, thanks for taking time for us. Rick, it's always a pleasure. So, you know, I look at the job numbers just out today, two and a half million new jobs last year, most in the service sector, manufacturing, not so much. Uh, but, you know, last month, 292,000 new jobs. But we actually, uh, people lost wages. Wages actually went down a penny in the month. You're absolutely right. Two things. One, with regard to your wages, we have to remember that the medium level of income of working families today, that is the exact center the family that's in the very middle of the middle class today is earning $4,000 less in real income than in 1999. You know, that's the problem. The middle class has been shrinking. I joined the Navy during the Vietnam War era. That year was the first year that the middle class shrunk in the history of America by a small percentage. And it kept up each year until last year when the middle class is now smaller than the higher upper income class or the lower income class. That's the challenge we have in restoring the American dream. Yeah, and I go back to, you know, the 2004 election cycle. Yeah, John Edwards, you know, running around talking about the two Americas. And, you know, it, you know for, never mind his problems, set that all stuff aside. But the reality is he was right. We have split and we are splitting continually into the two Americas, the haves and, well, the rest of us. That's right. What you ha- What you can see is that... About that same year I talked about during the Vietnam War era, then the income was of the percentage increase over the next few years. You can see something like 200% or so went to the upper income. What we cannot afford is to have trapped populations. And as you drive through our cities, even in our rural communities, what you find is these two different levels you've talked about. The problem is the lower one is growing larger. And, you know, as you look at this, you know, we see so much coming out of Washington. I mean, yesterday, I don't know if you saw this just the other day, the 62nd repeal of the Affordable Care Act. And I go, you know, for the, the, the problems that it has, I think if we would have spent those 62 votes and all of that energy and all of that, that vitriol and all of that in making it better, uh, I think we'd be better off than just another wasted opportunity, another wasted tax dollar. Uh, it just seems to me we can't get things done anymore, Joe. That's the problem down in the United States Senate. It has always was intended under our Constitution to kind of cool things down a little bit, slow things and look at them more wisely, because each person's there for six years. Then in the House of Representatives, where sometimes passions, because you've got a two-year election cycle, say, well, let's quickly do this. But you know what? The Senate's become a deep freeze. And the rules of that Senate, the arcane old, old rules there is about the only thing that hasn't changed in America. And people use it there, down there, just to stymie forward progress. And here's the interesting tidbit. We know today on the Affordable Care Act that the premiums on all four levels, gold, platinum, silver, all four bronze, are less than they are with the, of the, of the health care plans outside the Affordable Care Act. And not only that, next year, Medicare would have begun to run dry, starting to have, headed towards insolvency if it wasn't for the Affordable Care Act that extended it. 
almost a decade and a half. So let's talk about the big plan, this this idea to restoring the American dream for working people. Uh, walk me through some of it. What, what's the idea? The idea is that two conservative, two liberal think tanks came together just before the recession we came through a few years ago. They looked at those who were in their upper 30s, about the time you become set into where you're going to kind of be on the income strata. Are you going to be a radio host? Are you going to be a lawyer? Are you going to be a a naval officer? Or what are you going to be? And they looked at those in their later 30s, generations, this generation, and each generation before that. Their parents in their 30s, their grandparents in their 30s, and those that were in the late 30s, just before the recession, was the first generation in the modern history of America that had not done better than their parents in real income and benefits included. And the conclusion was the American dream has been broken. So when I walked across Pennsylvania and listened to people, I then published a book to say, how can we restore the American dream based upon what needs to be done from education to the proper investment in small businesses to ensuring that there's health security, to ensuring that there's a fair distribution to labor from the productivity that increases in our industry every year. And then as I continue to walk, I put out this plan that said, here's how we can restore the American dream, that wages will increase so that your children will have an opportunity to do better than you. It talks about manufacturing. It talks about law tra- uh, assets that we don't take advantage of, those who have just come out from prison, immigration it talks about, and even from education to seniors. There's no one magic wand like Harry Potter can wave. This is hard work, and you need someone, a senator, who will be down there and will make things happen rather than stop things from happening. You know, I, I look. You brought up the the manufacturing, and just you know, in the last segment, uh, we talked about the job growth. Uh, two hundred ninety-two jobs, two hundred ninety-two thousand jobs in in December, but only nine th- or eight thousand of them were manufacturing jobs. And you know, we we look at those as those production jobs, those making things, uh, that that value added kind of job that that grows an economy. And and I'm just not seeing that growth. And I, I believe it comes back to our trade policies. I believe it comes back to uh, how much control corporate America has over our Senate and over our policy making. And to me, you know, it's got to be putting people into those places. They're thinking about the average guy, the you know the the, the ham and eggers who are going to work every. day day. I want someone like that. You know, you're absolutely right. When I had my first job in the Navy, I had the artisans, those who were the welders, those who were the electricians that made things happen. We know that large industries are taking advantage of the United States Senate. It's why I turned down lobbying offers from them after I didn't win the Senate race, because they impact unduly down there. Think about this. Right now, if a company closes a factory in Pennsylvania and opens it up in China, they get to write off their taxes. The cost of opening it up and building a factory in China, I've, we should close that. And yet a bill was there to say no and say, but if you close the factory in China and move it back here, we'll let you write that off for jobs here. And that you know what? Sense. Industry rolled in on people like Senator Toomey and others, and they voted against it. Finally, this. Think about manufacturing alternative energy. Every million dollars invested in oil or gas industry gives you one job. Every million dollars invested in building a wind turbine, for example, where there's 400 tons of metal, manufacturing gives you 4.5 jobs because it's manufacturing. And that's what we got to emphasize and get politics Get rid of the money from high industry and high do- individual donors that are unduly uh, impacting restoring the American dream. So we're maybe thinking about you know undoing some of the the, the corrosive at- uh, uh, effects of Citizens United, maybe with some legislation, or because I look at this and you go, who who's getting what they want out of our government, and it's certainly not working people. This is pro- you're absolutely right. I mean. This is probably the time in our history where the government of the people has been so looked down upon by the people because it is not working for the people. And that's what our Constitution said, we the people. And whatever we the people want to uh, 
proscribe, want to have, we should be able to say, look, we want health care for everyone and not have a small group that is unduly influenced by industry, a higher level, say, no, we don't. Let's try to repeal it. You know, I think they've forgotten that they are public servants in the U.S. Senate for the people. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. You're listening to the Rick Smith Show with Joe Sestak. Uh, website, josestak.com, running for the U.S. Senate uh, here in Pennsylvania. You know, I look at this this election, and, and you hear this a lot, Joe, that uh, this election is, you know, the most important ever. And I, I believe every election is the most important uh, ever because, you know, that's deciding who gets what. This next term, these these next several years, I think are really important because we need folks who are, are thinking visionary. I want leadership. I want statesmen who are thinking of, you know, investing in our infrastructure, investing in our kids and education and, and doing a lot of the things that I think you talk about in this. And if folks want to take a look at the plan, uh, the plan for restoring the American dream for wor- working folks, uh, we've got a link at the ricksmithshow.com. Just click on Joe's name, take you right there. Also at josestack.com. But, you know, I look at this and, and I think we We've woefully underinvested uh, in our own country, and that, that that's really very troublesome. You're absolutely right. Look, even the civil engineering uh, uh, review that was done of all the infrastructure we need in America to really regain where we have to be as the number one in the world, whether it's waterways, whether it's airways, whether it's railways, whether it's roadways, it is approximately 150 billion more per year, and you know I lay out in this restoring the American plan, uh, a dream how we can do that. We can do it with public-private efforts together to make it happen. But to do it, we have to think about Pennsylvania. We rank like 49th out of 50 states as the least efficient, effective roadways in America, and our bridges rank us in the top seven states of America as the most deficient. Trucks coming in have to request permission to go over certain bridges, and it gets denied because they're not structurally safe. Think of the impact on business, and so, and then profits, and then jobs. So that means we have to restore the dream, not as just everyone wants to think of the dream, but wants to have a result to where wages are increasing again because we've done the proper investment both in the infrastructure, yes, but in the human capital, the, the, the workers, the labor, so that they are most proficient and, and then get their fair reward in sharing half the productivity like they used to of industry becoming more efficient and effective because of them. And, and beyond that are the jobs that would be created by making sure that our infrastructure is tops in the world. I mean, the sad yeah. reality is we used to have the world's best infrastructure. We've fallen, I, I think the last thing I saw was 15th, 17th, somewhere down there. Yeah. And you go, we should, be, uh, we should be at the top of this. I mean, Rick, you hit it again because it, it, let's take this. Boy, when I was in the United States Navy and I was about to depart, I was talking about the United States of America had four deep water ports that could handle the most advanced container ships in the world. The types like Hong Kong offloads, where you have the sophisticated infrastructure and the uh, means to offload those containers quickly, swiftly, and then get them off on the railway, then get them on the roadway. Well, guess what? We still have about four super ports now. China, since that time I used to make that speech in the Navy, has some gone from zero to about 12. Wait a moment. If we want to be the hub of where everything comes and flows efficiently and effectively, we have to invest in that. And the revenues from that and the jobs created from that more than more than pay back for that investment. So the question then becomes, what has the incumbent Senator Toomey done in his six years? What what has he done to promote that stuff? Everything I see coming out of the senator, and I'm sure you've got a much uh, more intimate knowledge of this, everything I see from him is stopping things. And, and with another one of these folks with the tax cut fetish, uh, we can't raise revenues to invest in things. We, it just seems like everything stops at the, we have to tax cuts, and we give rich people more, more and more and more, and well, you, the rest of you suffer. Here's what he did two and a half years ago. As the transportation bill, the infrastructure bill, was coming up for a vote, he said in here in Pennsylvania, we must have a long-range plan for transportation. Then he went down to Washington, D.C. and quietly voted against it, in fact, filibustered it, so it would die in the Senate. 
Then he went in front of a Tea Party forum in Washington, D.C., and was overheard by a journalist who heard him comment, We did something constructive today. I told you we'd kill it, the transportation bill, and we did. Just, uh, That's the same thing he does for uh, veterans. He says, I'm concerned about my veterans. Veterans, he says, those who are committing suicide at too high a rate, those that don't have a job, the benefits that they need are being slowed. And yet, as a congressman, after he voted to send us to war, he voted against every Veterans Administration bill up until he was embarrassed this last December when just to, uh, when there was the scandal in, uh, in, in VA. Where was he for us vets when he said he was, but his votes were against it? Amazing stuff. Last question I've got for you. You know, We're seeing a lot of, of talk around the gun issue. Uh, the president issued the executive order, had the, the CNN thing last night, fake news on Fox saying, uh, you know, he's putting peppers and, and onions in his eyes. We see the insanity out in Oregon. Uh, what do we do and what, what has the senator done uh, to, to you know, move anything on the gun issue? Once again, we watched where finally an unfortunate massacre Newtown moved him to say he wanted background checks. The vote failed, and he said, we had our vote. It is now over. And yet Senator Manchin said, it's not over. I'm going to continue to fight like we do in the military. You want the guy in the foxhole next to you every night as the adversary is coming against you. Every night. Two years later, another massacre happened, and he came forward again, but only then backed off. Here's the issue. Twice he said in his last campaign, how he really felt. He said, my idea of gun control is a steady aim. I don't think you do things for political reasons. I don't think you do things just because, just because there's been a massacre. Your job as a leader is to prevent that massacre. And yet he was absent for so long until they happened. And that's my disappointment in Senator Toomey. Yeah, I'm with him. Joe, I appreciate the time, man. Uh, good luck on this latest tour as you are out there on the road talking about how we rebuild the American dream and, and, and really you know restore that dream for average, everyday working folks. Uh, I give you the credit, and I hope the best for you. Thanks, Rick. Have a great day. Thanks for having me on. Great talking with you. Again, you can check out the website, joesestack.com, or you can look at the plan. Go to thericksmithshow.com. Click on Joe's name. Take you right there. Quick break right back after this. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show.